Hey guys, welcome to video 19 for unit 1.4. This video is about cell transport. In this video we're going to take a look at active transport and passive transport. We're going to start out by just taking a quick look at what the cell membrane looks like. We call it the we call the idea that we use to describe this the fluid mosaic model because basically it tells us that the cell membrane is a fluid of phospholipids and embedded in that um, fluid skin is chunks of all kinds of things, proteins, cholesterols, carbohydrates, all sorts of things that help the cell do what it needs to do to make sure the good stuff comes in, the bad stuff stays out. So the cell membrane has two functions. The first function is it provides protection and some structural support, holds the cell together. And the second is that it regulates what comes in and what goes out of the cell. And we're going to focus on this second uh, function in this video. So it turns out that there is at least two types of cell transport. The first kind we've discussed as passive transport, where a cell doesn't need to use any of its cellular energy, or ATP, to, to allow something to come in or go out of the cell. And there are two types of tr a passive transport, diffusion and osmosis, that's the first type, and then something called facilitated diffusion, uh, that's the second. Cells can also use energy in active transport, and they usually will do this to pump something into or out of the cell against diffusion, that is to say against the concentration gradient. So instead of having stuff go from a high concentration in the cell to a low concentration out of the cell, they're pumping things the other way around. They're taking food particles or nutrients that are in low concentrations outside the cell and pumping them into the cell where there's a higher concentration of those items. And to do that, they have to use energy. There are two types, uh, well, I guess three types of active transport, primary and secondary active transport, which use small channels. Those are for small particles. They use small channels in the cell membrane and then endocytosis, which is for bringing in larger amounts of material. So remember that diffusion is the movement of particles from a high concentration to a low concentration. And so when we look at diffusion occurring across the cell membrane, what we see is that there's a high concentration of particles, in this case the blue uh, hexagons, pentagons, pentagons on one side, the outside of the cell, and those will diffuse, they'll move just simply move through spaces between phospholipids into the intracellular space, the inside of the cell. And so over time, we see that eventually the, uh, the amount, the concentration of those uh, particles is even inside and outside of the cell. And that happens with simple diffusion. So a lot of particles, particularly things like solutes, will pass through the cell membrane going from high concentration to low concentration. Osmosis is another way that the cell can bring substances in or have substances leave the cell. Osmosis is just particular to water and you know that cells um, have to be, um, uh, cells can experience all kinds of problems if they're not in uh, a solution that is isotonic to the solution inside the cell. So they could lose water or they can gain water if the solution outside the cell is not the same as what's inside the cell. Facilitated diffusion is something new. We haven't seen this before. We're still talking about passive transport, which means that no cellular energy is used for this process. And we're still talking about diffusion, so we're seeing particles go from a high concentration to a low concentration. In this case, the high concentration is outside the cell, in the extracellular space. The low concentration is inside the cell in the intracellular space. And we have two types of particles. There are the little hexagon particles, and then there are the little oval particles. Now, these are particles that maybe can't pass through the phospholipid bilayer. Maybe they don't have the right charge or the right shape, or maybe they're too slightly too big. So in this case, the cell has special channels, protein channels, like this one, that can allow those particles to move through. Now this protein channel is probably shaped in a precise way to allow only one kind of particle through. So if the cell wants to have 
the oval-shaped particle come through, it might use something different. This is something called a protein carrier. It works very similar to a protein channel, but it's more like a trap door, and it may fit just one type of molecule. So protein channels and protein carriers are just molecules embedded in the cell membrane that help to pull or help to allow the passage of solutes or particles um, through the cell membrane using diffusion. So they help diffusion along, that's why it's called facilitated diffusion. Primary active transport is where we see ATP or cellular energy being used to pump particles from one side of the membrane to the other. There's my dogs. All right, so it's spring, it's nice out, my dogs are all outside, the windows are open, the doors are open, and it's going to be a little noisy. Sorry about that. So anyway, let's get back to primary active transport. So primary active transport means that ATP is being used directly to pump something across the cell membrane. And so we're going in this case from a high concentration, sorry, we're going in this case from a low concentration to a high concentration. We're going the opposite way of diffusion. So if we take a look at this particle, uh, the little orange uh, hexagon, these are particles of sodium ion. And they will exist in a low concentration inside the cell, but a high concentration outside the cell. And in order to get them out, this, out of the cell, the cell uses ATP. So in this case, there's a little, proton, a little protein uh, trapdoor that's specifically designed to um, to accommodate the sodium ions. The sodium ions flow into it, and then ATP is used to close the end that's inside the cell and open the end that's outside the cell and allow the sodium ions out. Now, potassium ions are going to go into the cell, but again, it's going to be against the concentration gradient. And so the same trapdoor molecule can be used to bring potassium across the cell membrane. Um, what happens is the potassium molecules enter the trapdoor, and when they do, do so, it causes the trapdoor to reset to its original configuration where the door is open inside the cell. So I don't expect you to know all of the details, but what I do want you to know is that primary active transport uses ATP directly to pump molecules one way or the other across the cell membrane, and always against the concentration gradient. Secondary active transport uses ATP energy indirectly. So in this case, we've got two molecules. The first molecule circled in purple here is the sodium molecule that was pumped out by the other mechanism on the last slide. The other molecule might be an amino acid, and the cell would like to pump these amino acids out if it can. Now, because the sodium molecules were pumped out using ATP, they exist in a high concentration outside of the cell, and they want to diffuse to the lower concentration inside the cell. When they do that, they can only enter through this little molecule that looks like a revolving door. And so what happens is those sodium molecules pass through the revolving door molecule uh, using diffusion, and the energy that they bring with them uh, through diffusing through that revolving door molecule is then used to push out the amino acids. So in this case we have sodium going from a high concentration to a low concentration by diffusion and the energy that it uses to do that is then used to pump out the amino acids from a high concentration to a low concentration. Phagocytosis is a type of endocytosis. Endocytosis means that the cell is bringing in large particles into the cell. Phagocytosis means cell eating. In this picture, we see an amoeba consuming a large red food molecule in three stages. At the top, you see the first stage, the amoeba's cell is coming right up against that food molecule, and then it's going to surround that food molecule and enclose the food molecule into a vacuole inside the cell. Now that's how many cells bring in large molecules or large food items into the cell. Now the reason this is important is because it allows the cell to digest stuff. Remember from the last unit we talked about lysosomes as being part of 
the cleanup crew or part of the digestive system of a cell? Well, in this case, phagocytosis has allowed this cell to bring in a bacteria as a food particle. And when the vacuole that has the bacteria combines with the lysosome, those digestive enzymes then break down the, the uh, bacteria into particles that the cell can use, and eventually those will be absorbed by the cell as part of its food. Pinocytosis is a mechanism by which the cell brings in water droplets. So if a cell is in a, an environment that causes it to lose water, it can recover that water by closing off or pinching off little bubbles of the surrounding extracellular fluid and bringing those little pinched in bubbles, those vesicles, into the cytoplasm of the cell where that water can be absorbed. That's the end of this video. Sorry for all the dogs barking, uh, but please complete the corresponding review questions and be prepared to show me notes in class. Oh, and here's your bunny of the day. This is an Angora rabbit, and I know a special student who frequently wears a pink Angora sweater. Well, this is where that material comes from.